Hello and a very warm welcome to um, a video exploring uh, the use of feed-forward neural networks um, to predict time series. Uh, and we're going to build um, an autoregressive model. Um, and uh, so essentially we're going to be using lagged data and we're going to be feeding that data into a uh, neural network, a standard neural network. Um, so uh, the issues are that we need to ensure that our data is in the right form format for our neural network, exactly the same as you would have with the ordinary least squares regression problem. And then we're going to generate forecasts now using three approaches. So the first two approaches are what we've already seen, and that is we're going to generate an iterative forecast using the same method as we use with ordinary least squares regression, a direct modeling approach where we build multiple neural network models to predict uh, individual time points in the future. Um, but the cool thing about neural networks is we can also have multiple outputs from our model so we can predict a vector of values. So instead of having 12 models that predict 12 points into the future, we might have one that predicts all 12 values in one go. So I'm here in Google Colab um, for using TensorFlow. Um, I'm saying here in the notebook, you need at least 2.1.0, but you'll have the bang up to date version in Colab. Um, so I'm bringing in NumPy, Pandas and Matplotlib, um, also Seaborn just to, to uh, spruce up my charts. Uh, and then I'm gonna bring in all the standard things that we need from TensorFlow, Keras, from building uh, simple sequential models. Um, and the layers we're gonna use are input, dense, and flatten. Uh, we're bringing in the Adam optimizer, because that's what we normally use, the sequential model. Uh, and also I'm bringing in the early stopping callback. Uh, yes, I am trustworthy. Uh, it's complaining about That's something off my computer. Okay, so good, we're using TensorFlow 2.3.0, so no problems there. So what do we need to do? So we need to build a table of data in the same way we did with an ordinary least squares regression. So the first thing I'm gonna do is generate the same cosine wave that we used before. Let's plot that. So here it is, so our, our really simple um, uh, time series that we're going to forecast. And now I need to convert this into a table of data. And I do that in exactly the same way, with exactly the same code as I used last time. So again, I've brought in this sliding window function. Let's run that. And now I can pre-process my time series. Um, so I'm passing in a window size of two. So that returns some training data, X train and Y train. So the X train data is two columns of data and 131 rows. And our Y train is 131, um, it's, a, it's a vector. So it's a slightly different bit of NumPy magic I'm using here to reshape. And that's to do with uh, the shape that our neural network will expect. Okay, so that's the only difference between the code in our ordinary least squares regression approach to sliding window and our Keras approach to sliding window. So just to refresh your memory, if we've got a sliding window of size two, two lags, then if this is the first three points in our time series, one, 0 0.98 and 0 0.92, then our X train, the first value in that vector, is this, the first two values in the sequence. And our Y train is just a scalar value is 0 0.92, which is the third value in this sequence. And if we slide our window along one, 
we now start from 0 0.98, okay, so we go 0 0.98, 0 0.92, uh, 0 0.82. So our x train vector is 0 0.98 and 0 0.92, and our y train scalar value is the last value in that sequence, 0 0.82. So let's look at that in pandas again, just so this is crystal clear in our mind. That what we've done is we've converted our single column of time series into multiple columns and we're using those for regression. Okay, so next up we'll take a look at the neural, a, sim, a really simple neural network architecture um, for predicting this time series. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can uh, fit a Keras model to our time series. Um, so we've processed our data and it's now um, in a regression format, in a tabular format. Um, so now we're gonna take a look at a, a really simple model in Keras. We're gonna mimic a, a linear model um, with a, a Keras neural network model. Um, and that's what this function get linear model does here. So we're passing in the window size, the number of lags we want to include in our model. Um, and we are also passing in a learning rate and any metrics we want to track. Um, so if we pass that as none, we're basically saying let's track the mean absolute error and the mean squared error, which are standard measures you would track in a regression problem. And then for a linear model in, in Keras, it's, it's super simple. Uh, so it's a sequential model as usual, exactly as we've seen before. Um, and then there's a single dense layer um, of the shape of the, uh, the input shape is the, the window size. And then we compile that model um, we're using the mean squared error as our main loss um, and our optimizer is Adam with our learning rate which by default is 0 0.01 and then any additional metrics we want to track and then we return our model. So this is just a, a function that builds the model for us so we can reuse it again and again. Uh, and then we have a script to run that model. So we're going to run 100 epochs in training. Uh, remember an epoch is a complete forward and backwards pass for all mini batches within the data. Uh, we're going to include a, a model with a window size of five, so five lags initially. Uh, and we're gonna throw in a, a, an early stopping callback um, to try and, uh, well, to regularize the model so that if we um, start to overfit, uh, then the model will stop and uh, we should, let's restore best weights. Oops. It's not too much of a big deal when your patience is two. Um, so basically if the model isn't improving after two or it starts to overfit, we'll wind back and take the best weights that we found. So the first thing we do is we call our sliding window function um, and create our training data. Uh, then we do a train test split, as we've, exactly as we've done before, nothing different yet. Uh, then we compile our TensorFlow and Keras model, we call get linear model. Um, and then because this is so simple in Keras, we just call model.fit and we pass in our training data, the number of epochs we want to run um, our validation data. Uh, we're going to call this verbose one, which means it's going to run silently. Um, and we're going to say, please pass in the callback for early stopping um, so that we can wind back to the best weights to avoid overfitting. So let's run that. That should run fairly quickly. Uh, that's done. Okay, great. Uh, and then we can plot our results history and um, we're going to plot the loss function and we're also going to plot the loss on the validation function. Um, so we can see it converges really quickly. Um, in fact, it's, it only takes four epochs to train the data, uh, train the model, uh, and you get a fairly low loss. 
We could probably fine tune that a little bit if we wanted to. So let's look at forecasting one step ahead. Uh, so we can do this in, in one line of code. Um, so all we're going to do is pass in the first example from our test data. So that looks like this. So it's a model with um, five um, lags, five lagged values in it. Um, and they are um, standardized values. And then we're going to call predict and we pass in our um, our first element of our test data and we're calling reshape so a bit of numpy magic to make sure that this single uh, value is in um, the right format let's take a quick look at that so this is what the test data looks like um, normally uh, if we then call reshape on that it almost looks the same. There's a, there is a subtle difference, okay? So this is an array within an array, okay? So we could pass in multiple training instances in one go to see what would come out. And that would give you multiple one-step forecasts. But we don't wanna do that. That would be a mistake. Your model would not perform that well in the real world. Um, so we pass that in. And the uh, and call predict, um, and the model returns your prediction into the future. Now you might notice um, uh, there's this array notation after predict. Let's also take a look at that. This again is all to do with arrays and the shape of things as when they're returned. Okay, so let's call predict. So what you get back is a multi-dimensional NumPy array. So it's an array of arrays. Um, so there's different ways to, to access that value. So if we did that, we'd, we'd just get a single array. Um, we, could, we could type it like this, and that would give us a scalar value, an individual value. Um, but for shorthand, we can just type this, and that will give us the first element of the first array within our prediction, which is what, which, which is what we're after. There's only one value there. So there's our one step forecast uh, and this was our actual value. So it's not, it's not um, super accurate. So we should train it. Let's train it a bit more and see if we can do better. Let's increase our window size. Let's go up to 12 and um, let's put our patients up to 10 and run the model. And then see how that's done. Oh, so we've run the full 100 there. Okay. Um, so if we go down and predict what's going to come out, a bit closer this time. Excellent. Okay, so we've seen how we can make a one step forecast. Let's have a look at making a multi step forecast using the iterative approach. So before we just we do that with Keras, let's have a look at some made up data. And we're just going to pretend that we've, we're putting that into a forecasting model. So we've got an array of um, X data here of lag data, this being the most 135 being the most recent lag, and 100 being the, the oldest lag we've included in our model. Okay, and we've now we're going to pretend we put that into our model and out popped a forecast of 111. That's our first forecast, forecast one. And now what we're going to do is we're going to update the data that we feed back into our model. So the data that we put in for, to predict point T plus two includes these lags, but this value of 100, the oldest lag in our model drops out. Okay. So we get 120 to 135. And our, and our most recent lag is, the, is a data that we predicted ourselves. It's 111. Okay, so that pops into that array. And then we push that back into our forecasting model. And the next value that pops out is 222. So on our third iteration to predict point T plus 3, our input array 
uh, looks like this. So now we've got two values, the latest two values in our lagged X array are predictions. Whereas the, these oldest three are still ground truth values. So what we need is a function within Python that will do this automatically for us. We don't want to be doing this manually each time. So that's what we've got here, the start of one here, and we're using a function called npRoll, which is just moving everything to one side and moving the oldest value up to the front, and then we just, we just write over that value. If I run that, so our latest forecast was 999. So our pre, our, before, we, before we called mp.roll, uh, sorry, after we called mp.roll, this was what our original data looked like, 110 to 222. After we call mp.roll, everything automatically moves down one place and the value at the end doesn't drop off, it comes back up to the top. So then we just call, we use some array slicing, indexing of minus one and copy over that value with our new forecast. And there we've got our array. So we can just implement that in a loop. And that's what the function autoregressive iterative forecast does. It takes the model, your initial array of X values and how far into the future you want to predict as input values. And then within here, we've got a loop. Um, so we're looping uh, up to the maximum forecasting horizon. Each time we make a one step forecast, we save our prediction in a list and then we roll our, our array and copy over the latest value in our input array with our prediction. And then we go back round that loop again and repeat until we've done that um, up to H. And then at the end, we return our list of predictions and we cast to a NumPy array because we like NumPy. Okay, so then you just have a, instead of having um, code of a loop in, you just call that, you call that function. You would do that again and again on different projects. Um, so we set our forecast horizon. We've already built our model um, and we fitted our data to it. So we just pass in our latest test value, um, call, uh, pass in H um, and we get our prediction. There we go. And that looks pretty good. So uh, that's been uh, a very simple problem. Again, that was a cosine wave. Let's try and make that a bit more difficult. We're going to add in a little bit of noise, random, uh, normally distributed noise, um, just to make that a bit more tricky. So we're just calling mp.random.normal um, and passing in a, a, a creating 200 noisy points um, with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 0 0.2. So not, not very noisy, but here, this is what you end up with, say, so, um, slightly more tricky to forecast than before, although there's still a clear signal in there. Uh, so now let's try our uh, linear model on that. Uh, we've got patience 10 here again. That's trained again really quickly. Let's plot our results. So again, we've gone up to 100. Um, so you can see that the, um, well, in this case, the validation loss is um, lower than the actual uh, training loss. That's quite interesting. Sometimes happens on simple problems. So this is what our fitted values look like. Um, so these are predict. This is predicting the model predicting the training data. So data the model was trained on and has already seen. Um, and you can see it's a reasonably good fit to the data. The model's been able to learn the pattern in the data quite nicely, very easily, really. So then we can call our forecasting function, our iterative forecast function, and produce an array of predictions. Let's see what that looks like. So uh, we're now looking at this part of the time series. Um, so the blue is our iterative forecasting method. 
and the orange is our ground truth value. So you can see that it continues with the right sort of pattern into the future, which is exactly what we want. So that was the iterative approach, which is all about making a one step prediction and then um, rolling the array and adding the new value in. But we could also use the direct forecasting approach here. So that, if you remember, is all about building multiple forecasting models. Uh, so here, what the notes are saying is that the length of Y test is 57 periods. So if we want to predict each of those points, we need to build 57 models under the direct forecasting method. So essentially what you have is a loop. Okay, and the lo each time in the loop, it trains a new model. And it does that using the sliding window function by passing in the new forecasting horizon. So that will just change uh, the, which point you're predicting into the future. So your training data will stay the same, but the point that you're trying to predict will go further into the future. So we then do a train test split. We then compile the model. So get, we're using that get linear model function. Uh, and here I've tweaked the learning rate a little bit. Um, you might want to play about with that. And then we, we fit the model. We're running it for, uh, we just specify how many epochs we want to. So I put this in a, a sense I've put this in a function called tra train direct models. Um, now the other thing I'm doing is uh, saving the models. So there's a, um, a parameter here called save. If you're running this in Google Colab, uh, when you call this function, um, it, you should specify save equals false. Okay, so this won't, that won't work on Colab, but it will work on um, if you're using Jupyter. So let's create that function. Uh, and then I've got a second function called load models. Um, so if you're, if you're doing this offline, um, outside of Colab, then you might want to, you, what this function will do is save that to a, a subdirectory called output. And this what function will load it from a function called output, uh, from a directory called output. We're not gonna do that though. We're going to train our models. Okay, so, um, right, so we've got the a script here. So we wanna run it for 100 epochs. Um, we're going to predict the length of the Y test. We're going to predict every point. Um, we're going to use a model with a window size of 12. Um, our initial training length is uh, 130. That's our train test split. Um, and we're going to load from file false. And the other thing I'm going to do is that was just called save. Say save equals false, run that. So it's training the models and it's gonna train a total of 57 of them. So that'll take a few minutes. Okay, that's done. Um, so we, we've now trained 57 models. Um, so we've got a variable direct models and that contains a Python list and each element or item within that list is a Kent Keras model. So how do you predict when you've got uh, multiple models? Uh, well, you just loop through them. And then each time you give them the same training, uh, same data to predict from, and they'll predict a different point in the future. And you just aggregate all of those results together and return them in a single array. So the function direct forecast um, does just that. It creates an empty list called preds, 
and then it loops through all of the models you've passed in. Each For each of those models, it calls predict, um, with a little bit of NumPy magic, obviously, there to get things in the right shape. Uh, and then it stores the prediction in a list, and then it returns the list as an umpire array at the end. So nothing complicated there. So let's call direct forecast on our models. I mean, a bit of a grumble about something there internally, but nothing to worry about, just a warning. Okay, so then we can plot the direct forecast data against the test data. Um, just to keep it absolutely clear what I'm doing here, I've, I've repeated the um, pre-processing for you so you know exactly what data we've got. So here we go. So the ground truth is the orange and the blue is our direct forecast. So you can see that's a little bit noisier than um, the iterative forecast. A little bit of a more noisy forecast. Um, so it's perhaps thinking there's patterns in the data that isn't there. Um, or perhaps some of the signal gets lost in the iterative forecast due to this smoothing from... Hmm. Yeah, that makes me think a little bit. Anyway, that, that's that's what we've got. Um, it's okay. So now what are we going to do? So um, let's plot them against each other to start off with. So, oh, so this is good. This speaks to the point that I was trying to make. Okay, so we've got the ground truth data in green. Okay, the green dash line is the original data. Um, our direct forecasting method is this noisy blue line and then you can see the orange line is much smoother and the smoothness of that increases the further away from the forecast origin. So what we're going to do is we're going to see which of those produce the better forecast in our um, in our holdout sample. So we've imported um, root mean squared error. Uh, this is just um, some warning from uh, inside stats models. Stats models moans a lot. Um, there's always things to remember. Don't worry about that. Uh, root mean squared error iterative method. Okay, what do we get? Uh, 0 0.25 and then the root mean squared error of the direct method is 0 0.39. So in this particular single holdout sample example, uh, the iterative method outperformed the direct method. And I think we kind of guessed that might be the case from looking at how noisy the direct method results were. Um, that isn't a generalizable result. Um, it may it may be different on different models, you know, real healthcare data. Um, and also it might be different over different holdout samples within this particular data set. Okay, so the last thing we'll um, look at in terms of um, forecasting from a uh, Keras model um, is forecasting a vector of y. So instead of iteratively predicting individual values or doing a direct forecast of an individual value, we're going to forecast a chunk of data points into the future in one hit, in one go. Um, so we do that by training our model on slightly different data. So what we've got here is a modified version of the sliding window function. So take a bit of time to digest this. I recommend you either pause the video now or you uh, come back to this afterwards and compare this version of sliding window with the version at the start of the notebook. So the main difference is this line here. Okay, so take check that out, see what the difference is. You should, if you know array slicing, you should see why this produces a different result. So this is, instead of returning an individual value, this is returning a slice of the array. And that slice gets longer each time we go round this loop because of the horizon value. Okay, so we return the same thing, we return two arrays again. 
So now you've got that modified function, your, the rest of your code is pretty much identical. So let's, um, let's create our training data. But let's have a look at our Y train shape now. So you can now see um, that we are forecasting a horizon of 12. That means that we've got 130 rows, but each of those rows is of 12 in length. So each of those rows extends 12 into the future, whereas it was one before. So that's the key difference. So for f because this is um, a, a bit more of a tricky problem, the linear model isn't suitable, so we're going to build um, a proper feed forward neural network. So here um, we've got an input layer and then we've got um, a hidden layer um, where we can control the number of neurons and by default that's 32 um, and it has an activation function and that's connected to an output layer, a dense layer that has the number of outputs so that'll be of length 12 in our case. Again, we're using the Atom Optimizer um, and we're looking at mean squared error. Um, run that. Okay, so that doesn't do anything yet. That's just a function that we can call again and again in the various scripts we'll use. So, we're going to train the model for 100 epochs. We've got early stopping regularization. Um, we have a, a model now called model v underscore v. Uh, and we just get our um, more beefy network um, to try and predict that. And then we fit our results exactly the same. Okay, that trained pretty quickly. Let's have a look. Uh, so only trained for 40 um, epochs before it started to overfit a little bit. So if you want to predict a, um, 12 ahead, that's the same as a one step forecast. Now, so that's the beauty of, of this approach. So you don't have to, if you're just predicting 12 ahead, then you don't, you don't need any loops or anything like that. So let's run it. Ignoring the warning, that'll disappear in a future version, I'm sure. So here we go. There's our, there's our vector of uh, values into the future. That's great. So let's plot the prediction versus the ground truth. Um, so there's our forecast in um, orange and the real value is in blue. Um, so it's, re it's, it's quite reasonable. It's, it's picked up that it's an increasing part of that curve, no problem at all. But we've not predicted far enough ahead um, to predict the whole of the test set. So we need a new function that works in a similar way to the iterative forecast. And what it's going to do is rather than replace a single value in our input array, it's going to predict it's going to replace a vector of points. Uh, so, here it is, we've called that vector iterative forecast. So it takes the same values, it takes um, the model, the first input array and how far ahead you want to predict. Um, but it's, it, the function looks very similar, but there's a couple of subtle differences and, and that's here. Um, where we up to update the input array um, by, sh by shifting it, by rolling it across the length of how far you're predicting into the future. So if you're predicting 12 points into the future, you roll your uh, input array by 12, and then you copy, and you'll need to call copy to make a deep copy of the array over, over those values in the input array. And then we can catenate our results at the end and return them. So, H now represents the number of vectors ahead that we want to predict. So it's not the number of time points, it's the number of vectors. So we call our vector iterative forecast, we pass in our model, our vector model, we pass in off uh, our initial ground truth data, and we pass in H, the number of vectors ahead to predict. 
and then uh, let's have a look at that. Here we go. Uh, so a touch of pre-processing here just to put everything into a single list um, for plotting. And here we go. So we have um, our blue line, which is our test data. And then we have our forecast, which is this orange line. And that looks pretty good to me. That's pretty smooth. Uh, so that seems to have worked quite well. Um, we've not measured the root mean squared error of that. Okay, so um, that took a bit of jiggery pokery just to remember what I needed to do um, because my, my Y test data wasn't quite in the right format. Um, but if you can concatenate all of that data together um, and compare it to your predictions, you get a root mean squared error of 0.227. Okay, so it's it's slightly better than the other forecasts, um, which is a nice result, but again, it's not a generalizable one. So that's a brief introduction to time series forecasting using a feed forward neural network. Um, so what you can see is it, it is more involved than the other packages we've looked at. Um, it really comes into its own when you've got um, more data and when you have multivariable data. Um, it's a tricky thing to get to grips with, um, but there's some code provided in this notebook which should help you start your journey. Hope you enjoyed that.